Welcome to Seattle, Washington. This is an amazing place for geology. What's beneath that noisy stadium? It's a long way down to bedrock. The bedrock here has been buried by more than a thousand feet of muds, sands, gravels that were dumped here by ancient ice sheets, distant volcanoes, old lakes and rivers, even by early residents of Seattle. And there's an earthquake fault here, a big one. It's all right here. There's lots to learn. You ready? It's game time. Dig into most of Seattle's hills and you'll find complicated sets of poorly sorted rocks and beds of sand and gravel that were dumped here by an ice sheet that came from Canada. The Puget Lobe advanced and retreated over Seattle at least seven times in the last two million years. Each ice advance laid down a different generation of glacial till. Canadian rocks strewn all over the Puget Lowland stretching from the Olympic Peninsula clear over to the Cascade Range. Deposits that were first mapped in detail by J. Harlan Bretz back in 1913. Kind of hard not to notice a boulder like this, right? Glacial erratics carried in ice from the north. The most recent advance began 25,000 years ago in British Columbia. Ice crossed the border 19,000 years ago and made it as far south as Tenino, Washington by 16,900 years ago. That was just yesterday geologically. The glacier was 3,000 feet thick over Seattle. Yep, I said 3,000 feet thick. Ice that was three Columbia centers high. The weight of the ice caused the crust to sag by as much as 300 feet. Since 16,000 years ago, Seattle has been ice-free and the crust has rebounded, but the blanket of glacial deposits remain. Almost 75% of Seattle's surface deposits were laid down by the most recent ice advance. Bedrock here is hard to find. Only 3% of the Seattle area has exposed bedrock at the surface, steeply dipping sandstones in a sea of loose glacial rocks. Bluffs throughout the Puget Sound reveal complexly interbedded glacial and interglacial deposits, and Seattle's famous rain makes these deposits especially prone to landslides, sometimes with tragic results. As it flowed south, the Puget Lobe acted like a comb running over the landscape, sculpting graceful, elongated, north-south oriented hills called drumlins. Beacon Hill, First Hill, Capitol Hill, Queen Anne Hill, Mercer Island, they're all drumlins. One of the very few drumlin fields in all North America. Have you driven here in Seattle? The traveling's easy going north and south along drumlin tops or through valley bottoms, but driving east or west here means you're going against the lay of the land. When east-west streets are necessary, steep climbs are in order. Interstate 90 cuts across the grain, one of the most expensive stretches of our country's interstate system. The freeway tunnels through drumlins and uses bridges to span Ice Age troughs between the drumlins. As you leave Seattle on I-90, you skirt around the north end of one drumlin and then drive through the next one. Then a floating bridge over a trough, then crossing another drumlin. Talk about obstacles! If these tunnels were magically lined with glass walls, we'd see blue clays at the base, sorted sands and gravels in the middle, and poorly sorted glacial till at the top. During its march over Seattle, the advancing Puget Lobe, a 3,000-foot-high bulldozer, was an on-the-move broad apron of rocks and dirt that blocked north-flowing rivers. As the Strait of Juan de Fuca was blocked by the Puget Lobe, the Puget Sound filled with a massive lake, and for hundreds of years, clay settled to the bottom. At its peak, the glacial lake was 120 feet higher than current sea level. As the ice pushed south, its outwash plain deposited rocks and sand over the clay. 
Eventually, the glacier overrode these layers, and when the climate warmed, the ice dropped the poorly sorted rocks that it was carrying. Imagine Colombian mammoths roaming the scene. Another mammoth tusk was recently discovered beneath downtown Seattle, a long-ago tranquil Ice Age scene that now is just a little bit different. Seattle's shoreline in the 1850s was very different than today. A winding freshwater Duwamish River, Seattle's only river, used to meet and mix with salt water at the southern end of Elliott Bay. Fine sands in the Duwamish were washed to Seattle from the front of impressive volcanic mudflows, lahars, from a still active Mount Rainier on the horizon. The most recent major lahar from Rainier was 2,200 years ago. Seattle's first white settlers arrived at Alki Point in November of 1851, surrounded by steep hills under a dense forest. The trees, up to 2,000 years old and towering up to 400 feet, loved the climate and the soils. A few months later, the settlers took an Indian canoe, a clothesline, and a bunch of horseshoes out into Elliott Bay to see if it was deep enough to serve as a harbor. The harbor passed the test, and in 1853, plats were filed to establish a new town called Seattle. Down at the Tide Flats, this place was mud and salt water, a popular food gathering spot for local Native American tribes. The mud flats only visible during low tide twice a day. It was a quiet, natural place with birds, salmon, and acres of clams. It's not quiet anymore. These football fans have been so loud they've registered on local seismic stations. None of this was here in the 1850s. And I'm not talking about the stadium, I'm talking about there was no land here. In 1895, just a few years after a devastating citywide fire, Seattle city leaders announced a bold new civic project to radically alter the city's roller coaster topography. Hills would be removed and the dirt would be dumped onto the tidelands. Seattle needed new flat areas to grow. Horse-drawn wagons were lined up to accept dirt from neighboring hills and delivered the earth to the tide flats. Then more creative and efficient solutions emerged. The hills were washed directly into the bay using sluicing equipment, a mixture of soil and water that was shot into large chutes for transport directly over land and into the bay. No blasting was needed, right? They weren't dealing with bedrock. Eventually, the regrade project was perfected to the point of using conveyor belts. Not everybody loved this hill moving business. There were some holdouts. Folks that elected not to participate were left stranded on what became known as spite mounts. All told, 60 regrades dumped millions of tons of earth from Seattle's hills, creating almost 3,000 acres of new land. Interstate 5, that runs along the base of Beacon Hill, traces the original saltwater shoreline. Hills flattened, rivers rerouted, shorelines extended. Seattle is one of the most dramatically engineered cities in the country. If we drill at the 50-yard line in Seahawk Stadium, we would encounter 40 feet of man-made fill and more than 1,000 feet of Ice Age sediments before we hit bedrock. But at nearby Alki Point, that same bedrock is at the surface. What's going on here? The Seattle Fault, an east-west crack in the bedrock that runs from Bainbridge Island all the way to Issaquah, lurks beneath the Puget Sound and downtown Seattle. The fault has produced at least four earthquakes in the past 3,500 years, and there is concern for future magnitude 7 earthquakes here. It's a thrust fault with a 35-degree dip to the south. There's been more than 5,000 feet of offset on the fault over the last 15 million years. My God, how many earthquakes are we talking about here to produce that kind of offset? 
Plate tectonic forces responsible for past Seattle Fault earthquakes continue to squeeze the crust here. The San Andreas Fault, an active fault in California, is visible from the space station due to millions of years of motion and erosion that have etched out an obvious gash across the land. The Seattle Fault might be just as active, but our glacier wiped the slate clean less than 20,000 years ago and then dumped a thick layer of sand and gravel on top. All of that loose material makes it tough to unravel in earthquake history. The most recent earthquake on the Seattle Fault struck in the year 900 AD, a bedrock platform visible today at Restoration Point, an Alki Point, was formerly under the waves of the Puget Sound and is now high and dry above the tides. All of the bedrock south of the fault jumped up suddenly 20 feet during the earthquake. Seattle sits on loose glacial sediment and bay fill. Properly placed fill with the right materials can be strong, but in South Downtown, the city founders put just about anything in there as fill without any engineering considerations. Sawdust, wood chips, demolished building materials, asphalt, cinders, even garbage. Combined with the regrade hill materials, that's a 40-foot layer of fill. This stadium sits atop the worst possible soils in earthquake country. Seismic waves get trapped in basins with soft sediment and are prone to shaking like a bowl full of jello. The soft stuff shakes twice as hard as bedrock during earthquakes. Piles for the stadiums. Over 1,700 steel pipes up to 90 feet long were driven 50 feet into highly compacted glacially overridden deposits. This is a modern stadium built to current seismic standards, one of the safest structures in the region. Looking to the future, Puget Sound bluffs will continue to fail as landslides. Future Mount Rainier mudflows could easily reach Seattle. Magnitude 9 megaquakes strike every 500 years off of Washington's coast. Is that a more likely seismic threat to the city than the Seattle fault that lies beneath? There's so much geology here in Seattle, but we're just getting started. On our next episode of I-90 Rocks, let's jump on the freeway and head east, the 30 miles between Seattle and the foothills of the Cascades. Thanks for watching.